Hello and welcome. This short video is the result of me not knowing what to do, like many academics. I have far too many projects that I start, half develop, and then move on to something else. I have a conference in early January, and I'm not going to do anything with this other than put it aside after today. So, while the thoughts are still fresh, I presented on these topics uh, earlier this week in the final course on theology that I gave at university. So, what do I do with this? Is It's a conference paper waiting to happen, but will never happen because I have to move on to something else. So, fine, put it on YouTube. And the topic is what I want to talk about here in this introduction. So... Arguably, two of the most difficult or among the most difficult verses for theologians to address are Judges 19 and Matthew 10, 34. Yes, you have a list. Obviously, there are more verses that are problematic in the Bible for people of faith. But for today, these two I'll be discussing in some preliminary way. How is Judges 19 understood within the Gospel of Matthew? That's the intriguing question that I approached my students with and presented these findings, which please consider them preliminary, but I'm not going to develop them further. I have other things to do. But for anyone stumbling on this video, you know, David, what are you, what are you talking about? Okay, Judges 19. Uh, if you don't know about it, you're probably a happier human being for it. If you do know about it, you're very troubled. It's arguably one of the more... Actually, I don't know if it's the most gruesome, but for me, it's particularly problematic. Judges 19. And it's problematic for many, many, many more reasons that I'm going to get into today because very much my scope is limited and all the questions that it begs are better addressed by other academics who specialize on this text and on its reception throughout history. I'm only interested in one small question, small, I'm doing air quotes here, on how it's received within the Gospel of Matthew. So, what, David, what are you pushing aside here? Okay, Judges 19. The woman of Judges 19 is sexually assaulted and murdered, though more accurately to be said, she, she's murdered through sexual assault. Literally raped to death. And what is more... The text really emphasizes her suffering. She literally dies, literally as in it is written this way, crawling toward the threshold of apparent safety and dying with her hand on the threshold. So that, it is an incredible image of pain, of trauma, of suffering, of victimhood, and she's not even given a name. In fact, her very identity is that of victimhood. And she's dehumanized by this victimhood of becoming an object for what happens next in the text. Who she is, her own suffering, her own plight, she becomes incidental to the story itself Though we do have these images of her pain and suffering. And it's not resolved. It's left in tension. So for those uh, brave academics working on this text, you know, if uh, this video is seen by any of you, uh, please point to your own work uh, in the comments so people suddenly on this video can explore further. Again, allow me to have a scope of work. I'm not dismissing anything. I'm just you know, trying to keep this video manageable uh, before I go on to that conference paper I need to write for January. Judges 19, as it's represented in Matthew 10, 34. That is the focus for me for today, though there's much more to be said by more qualified others. With that in mind, let's make this investigation 
even more problematic by turning to the next slide. Okay, I perhaps should have warned you about the upcoming slides, so I'll give you a moment to recover. So this is a thing, and what I want to bring out for discussion here is the reception of Matthew, Matthew 10.34, today. So as you can see in the slide, yeah, there's stuff going on. So where to begin? Well, you're looking here at two books currently available through Amazon, and absolutely am. I'm not encouraging you to purchase either of these. But the point being is Matthew 10.34 is central to certain discourses popular among what is commonly called the alt-right. And... Yeah, I'm struggling in how to describe this. So the two books you're looking at here, uh, one you're seeing the cover, one you're seeing the interior and the opening words in which the prelude to the book itself is this verse from Matthew. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes shall be of his own household. Matthew 10, 34 through 36. So what's that meaning? Well, it's reception, how it's commonly understood, as I perceive it, it's very much Thanksgiving table, I'm, I'm a guessing, for many people in the United States where politics are dividing families, where certain members may be more alt-right and other members not. And these tensions give a feeling of justification of, I'm going to hold on to my alt-right beliefs because the Bible itself commands me to be at variance with you because I know I'm right, because the sword being talked about in Matthew 10, 34, seen as a very militaristic, nationalistic, cruel vision of what Christianity needs to be on the world stage. And in this narrative, there are some, not all, but some, who really like, appreciate, or whatever the word you want to use here, Donald Trump, as somehow as the manifestation of Christian virtue. So much so that at least the authors of these books are actually presenting him as the Christ. Okay, yeah, I really should have warned you about this coming slide. Functionally, I think these books are meant to be the extreme so that people who identify as all right will can be able to say, yeah, I don't agree with that, but dot, 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 then say something outrageous. But by definition, they sound moderate because they don't go this far. But you need to go have people go that far so other people feel moderate and feeling Christian aura surrounding Donald J. Trump. So, yeah, Matthew 10.34 is much more than a problematic verse of what does this mean that I did not come to send peace but a sword, problematic, confusing, a lot of tension with the Christ-like example of actual Christ. You know, we'll, we're going to get into all of this. This seems to be contrary to other preachings of Christ, like Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> the meek, the peacemakers, all that good stuff. What's going on here? So Matthew itself is everything. Let's understand this. On top of that is its reception today among the alt-right as an endorsement of cruelty, of war, of breaking apart families, and you know, everything else we see in the news. Though, yeah, I'm not that bad, but dot, 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 Christian aura surrounds Donald J. Trump. 
So let's talk about Matthew 10, 34, and then Judges 19 will actually clarify what I believe is its reception in the New Testament about why this verse appears this way and what it's actually saying about the Hebrew Bible. So that's also part of the scope of work today. And so for a little extra clarity for those unfamiliar with Everything that I've mentioned so far, here's a very unfortunate icon of this particular verse, Matthew 10, 34. So you see Jesus here holding a literal sword and a giant one, and he's standing on some sort of floor cushion, which really looks like a pool of blood. So, yes, what is the message seen that icons being writing for the illiterate uh, pictorial representation of the intent of the writers of the New Testament? What is the message that's perceived about Christian virtue in the world today and what Christians should do in the name of Christ when you see Christ holding a weapon of war? and surrounded with blood. How do you think this is being received uh, for Orthodox Christians in, in Russia who are told to go fight Ukrainian brothers, their own Orthodox brothers, turning brother against brother, father against father, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, all this. Yeah, this discourse is central to many narratives, not just the alt-right, but we can also see in the horrific, brutal, unjustifiable war of Russia against Ukraine, all in the name of God and Third Rome ideology, all that. So there's, there's plenty of context surrounding these verses and what they could mean both for intrinsic intent of, oh, what was Matthew thinking, you know, when he's drawing on Judges 19, and also how it's being received today and those who think they know what it means, and it means killing in the name of the Lord. So let's get into everything now. So a lot's going on with this slide, a lot of visual information. Hopefully I can clarify it all for you. So taking a look at Matthew 10, 34 through 36, depending on your Bible, depending on your translation, I want you to look for something here. That here in this translation, very, very helpfully, you're giving some information. So look at uh, 1035 here, those single quote marks. That means something's being quoted. Sorry for being pedantic there, but this verse is is obviously pointing to something in the Hebrew Bible. I've provided here the context. It is pointing back to Micah 7. We'll return to that. So this first signal here is these words of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew as pointing to something in the Hebrew Bible. And Micah, as you may guess, is prophetic. So type, anti-type, prophecy, revelation, something's happening here to state the obvious. Now, the second thing I'm going to point out in anticipation of this uh, little video is 1034, sword. It ain't a sword. So going to the Greek, that word is actually not a sword. It's a reference to Judges 19, actually 1929, you'll find the exact word in the Septuagint. This is correspondence. There's some intertextual exegesis happening here. Sword ain't a sword. What it is, is a, I guess in English you would say a butcher knife. It is a long knife used for kosher slaughtering of animals. It's not a weapon of war. Of course, any knife can be used as a weapon, you know, against someone else, but its specific purpose is for slaughtering animals. And this is what happens in Judges 19. So this unnamed woman 
victimized, brutalized, and dying with her hand on the threshold of safety, crawling after the assault. How brutal this is. What happens next is the context to understand everything. So what happened to her was so outrageous that it will set off a civil war within Judaism, within the 12 tribes. Well, actually, more particularly here, 11 tribes against one. So she is literally cut up into pieces, and each piece sent to a representative representative of each of the other tribes to say, look what the Benjamites did. They attacked her, they raped her to death, and this is so outrageous, everyone needs to get together and talk about what some of our own people did and what we're going to do about it. And it sets off a bloody, I don't know if that's a strong enough word, civil war that will result in every Benjamite dead except for 600 survivors who you know, come out of hiding, but no one's going to ever marry them again because you are absolutely terrible, horrible, no good human beings. How could you do this? But then that created another problem. The promises of God to the 12 tribes of Israel were going to have a tribe disappear from history because of the crime the Benjamites did to this poor woman. Many men attacked her. So in retribution, they wiped out the entire tribe, saved 600 men. But no one's going to give their daughter to one of these men. No. So what do they do? Well, they take wives of the Gentile nations in order to have the promises of God to the 12 tribes of Israel preserved and to continue salvation history. Now, previewing where I'm heading with this, Something's happening in this text that's anticipating the movement of Christianity within Judaism will have to turn to the Gentiles in order to build the church. So there's a very, I don't know, the word complicated message here of terrible offense against God that's going to require for God's salvation's history to unfold the inclusion of the Gentiles as it happened in Judges 19 and Judges 21. So there's something happening here to talk about how the Gentiles became part of this incredible history going back to Abraham. Let me just leave that at that for right now, because there's so much more to unpack before we talk about conclusions. I left the previous slide in. It was part of the original lecture to my students in this course on theology. It's there for context. You can freeze frame it. You can read it. So too with this one, I'm not going to read it to you, but I want to point out one detail that at least should be mentioned. Judges 19 begins and Judges 21 ends with the same refrain, the same framing around the story itself. And it's very much an editorial commentary about what you have just read. And looking here, Judges 21, 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in, in their own eyes, in his own eyes. So that begins the story. It ends the story saying, yeah, this, this is in no way proper, but in a dark time with no king and no direction, these things happened, or at least happened as recorded in sacred history and a cultural self-understanding of people that will become the texts that shape, you know, okay, reception history and actual history, you get it for scholars. So you get this framing of, yeah, this isn't right, this isn't good, but this has happened at a time in Judges before we actually had kings and actually had more information about how we should govern ourselves. So just something to highlight, the framing built around the story of Judges 19. 
So again, a lot of visual information given to you on the slide. Hopefully I can clarify it here for you. So Micah. Indicated previously, it is a prophetic text. David, how can you say it's a prophetic text? Well, let me show you. At first, let's begin with Micah 7 and selected verses from uh, 8 through 10 here. So, when I fall, I will rise. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Okay, these are Christological, very obviously Christological. Christ dying, coming back to life, bearing the indignation of the Lord, suffering in the flesh, atonement theology. You get it. There's also this curious note at the end, uh, very much an Orthodox, um, an Orthodox circle. We talk about Christ trampling down death by death in his resurrection. She will be trampled down like mud in the streets. Perhaps there's some sort of resonance there at the very least. Let me use the word resonance rather than correspondence. So trampling down like grapes becomes the blood of the Eucharist. Maybe trampling down also has something to do with this wider context as understood by Matthew. Just putting that out there. Again, everything I'm presenting is rather preliminary. Consider this like a conference paper you know, of those wonderful conferences where, you know, hey guys, I got ideas, can you help me develop them? And it's not antagonistic and not, uh, let me give you a question in the form of a long answer that's going to undermine you for even daring you to bring this to our attention. No one's had that experience in conference. So pertinent now to Matthew 10, 35 through 36, I mentioned before, yeah, that's Micah. Where exactly? Well, let's look at verse 6 here from Micah 7. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are the men of his own household. That's almost verbatim. Obviously, Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, is pointing toward this. And so, something is happening here with first he points to the sword it's not a sword it's a kosher slaughter knife that is the exact same word in the septuagint in judges 19 verse 29 now he's pointing to micah he's doing some sort of theology here he's combining micah and judges in the words of christ to say something is about to happen let's explore this more i'm just laying out evidence as we go So as New Testament scholars know, the Gospels were written with larger patterns of meaning that may not be known by many readers today who are only reading the text out of context. And one of those patterns of larger meaning are called doublets. You just do something once, you mention it again between the two, they resonate with each other, and you create an opportunity for exploration. So the idea of the sword reappears again in the Gospel of Matthew. So you heard about Christ bringing a sword. Now the correspondence of the doublet in Matthew is here, Matthew 26. The sword is not a weapon of war. Someone uses a one of these long knives and cuts off the ear of somebody and Christ says, no, we're not doing that. Put your sword in its place for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. So at the very least, particularly for those walking into this discussion with no academic background, the word complexity comes into play here. That literal text of I've come not to bring peace but a sword, I'm suggesting to you it's not a weapon of war because Christ very much discounts that. No, don't do this. Why does Christ insist on putting away your swords? It's not a weapon of war because he himself is going to be the sacrifice in order to achieve salvation history. I would believe what I just said is not controversial. But the point being is just because Matthew 10, 34 says sword, therefore pick up your assault rifle and then do bad things with it. No, not literal sword in the sense of killing people. Christ himself will be the victim. 
He will be the sacrifice. He'll be the atoning movement to reconcile God and humanity. So he's not literally talking about killing people here because the correspondence of the doublet is here perishing by the sword. Something more complex and theological is happening with the word sword here. Now, forgive me for my pedantic tone of voice that I just turned to, um, you know, uh, just then. So hopefully I have created an opening for us to consider maybe a more thoughtful consideration of Matthew 10, 34 through 36. To underscore the points just being made, though, yeah, okay, I'm kind of being pedantic here. Forgive me, forgive me. Christ's sacrifice. Professor, where are you getting this from? Uh, yeah, everything. Let's go here to John's gospel, just for context. Micah reappears here. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Christ's sacrifice. And there is a direct allusion to Micah here, 7, 8, and John 10, 17. Let's continue the thought on the next slide. So the point of this slide, it is redundant, but redundancy is good for the sake of for the sake of demonstrating that Micah is pretty central to whatever's happening in the Gospel of Matthew, of what is the sword, what is happening here, because the idea of the Good Shepherd is literally here in Micah, and we can take John's Gospel as being on the same page with Matthew, synoptic versus John, but everyone you know, is not presenting alternate theology here. And there's, I would suggest, a harmony within the New Testament, uncontroversial claim uh, for many devotional Christians today. But just pointing out the idea of the shepherd, the idea of sacrifice, this could be all of the context within the Gospel of Matthew for whatever is happening with Judges 19 and Micah in the words of Christ being presented. Forgive me for how preliminary this is all sounding, but I'm close to the conclusion. Your patience will be rewarded. So one other detail to be added here about Matthew's gospel. And it has to do with hyperbole. Though I use that word knowing that today the connotations of hyperbole sound jarring, of not literal, you're being hyperbolic here, but its actual uses in the gospel is to double down on a point, <laughs> to say, yes, I meant what I said here, even to an extreme, the point is still valid. It's a rhetorical way to emphasize a principle here of ethics. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I forgive, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times? And Jesus says to him, I don't tell you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. End quote. The point here is actually a little bit of humorous in this. It's like, Peter, I'm, yeah, God, I'm seeing a pattern here. This guy has sinned against me. I've forgiven him. After seven times, I think I've confirmed the pattern. Maybe it's time to stop this principle of turning the other cheek or whatever the, the issue is at hand here. And Jesus doubles down, using the common, common jargon today, and say, no, no, it's not about seven times until you no longer feel like it or you're sensing that it's not realistic. I'm going to take it to a hyperbolic extreme, 70 times seven, and he's not talking about 490 times. It's just, you want to provoke me with an outrageous situation? I'm going to make it multifold. No, 70 times seven. The principle still holds no matter how extreme you take it. That's the purpose of hyperbole. To the maximum extent, this is still true. Something in this sense of hyperbolic is also happening with the way Matthew understands Judges 19. Let's continue. 
So this is a short video, though it is seem to be dragging on a little bit, but even so, it is not as detailed as it needs to be to our, try to establish what I'm suggesting to you. It is the trial balloon. It is putting this out there. It is, you know, how much time you want to give to this video? Get to the point, please, David. Okay. There's the hyperbolic element here. The entire basis, let me stay, state it this way, though perhaps a little bit uh, for the sake of brevity, a little bit overstated, but God gives humanity a second chance after Eden due to the hospitality of Abraham. A quite a shocking moment. Abraham, not recognizing the Lord, invites him into his tent. And something about that incident moved God to say, I'm going to begin again with you. So the Abrahamic religions, because Abraham, <laughs> Abrahamic religions, is because of this incident. Unexpectedly, a stranger is given love protection, protection and hospitality. Being invited to someone's tent means I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. And God says, this was unexpected. Maybe I can work with you and your descendants are going to fill the earth and I'm going to start salvation history with you. So let that statement be as one understanding of what's happening in Genesis from the fall of Eden to what I'm saying here, a new beginning with Abraham. The point being, Abraham's important and hospitality and protection is important. What do we know about Judges 19? Teen. Well, it's a story of the opposite. That people under the protection of someone are going to be brutalized by the ones they needed protection from. And it's very much, Judges 19 reads very literally as what happens in Sodom. And in both cases, the need to protect the stranger is so hyperbolic. Hyperbolic in the sense of you do this no matter what. You take this to the nth degree of I'm going to protect these strangers as if I'm receiving God himself. So much so I will sacrifice even of my own household, my own daughters, my own concubine. I will do this in order because everything depends upon Abraham and what he did. So this is the principle that cannot be violated, hospitality. So much so, everything precious to me, I am willing to sacrifice in order to protect this because everything depends upon Abraham and his show of hospitality to God. You know, entertaining strangers may be angels in disguise. So the hyperbole here is this principle is paramount. And so there's very much, I would suggest, a contrast here between the hospitality of Abraham and what happens with the Sodomites and the Benjamites in their inhospitality, wrong word, yeah, to what happens in order to protect salvation history. So that's the other element to consider while I've moved to the final slide, and there's much rejoicing. Finally, David's getting to a point here about everything to understand and appreciate the words of Matthew in turning to Judges 19 in something of Jesus's message to the people of his day. Final slide, we're at the conclusion, much rejoicing for those who had patience so far. Uh, notice all the question marks that I throw out on this slide. So consider these preliminary. I wanna hear your feedback. So Judges 19 will set off a war of brother against brother, as told in Micah, as told in Matthew. The Benjamite Civil War, a war that will mean that God promises are going to have to be fulfilled by thinking outside the Judaic box of bringing in the Gentile nations, as I have already discussed. So what is Matthew actually specifically referring to here? I don't know. 
the two possibilities that I have is maybe it is recent history, the Hazomian War between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, a brother against brother that will result in the degradation of the people such that the Romans could just march in. And this is the problem that Jesus is going to resolve in some way. It could be that. It could be a reference to something about to happen. For example, the great Jewish revolt that will result in the destruction of the temple in the year 70 that will then require a diaspora expression and the church turning to the Gentiles to refill all the numbers that were lost. So that could be, what's the word I'm looking here? The political context for the words of Jesus at Matthew 10, 34 through 36 is, yeah, there's about to be a war or there has been a war that has caused a great offense to God that's going to require thinking outside the box and bringing in the Gentiles. And so this is point two of the slide. The restoration of God promises require Gentile wives. Well, Gentile nations will be brought into the Christian church as a deliberate move. <laughs> Paul's exact ministry and uh, Peter's letter to the uh, to the children of the diaspora, you know, bringing them in. So this movement to, yeah, the numbers and the full promises are now going to be included by turning to the Gentile nation, something mentioned many, 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 many places in the Hebrew Bible of the Gentiles will be included someday. This is the day. The last point perhaps is the most sensational one. What do we know about Judges 19? She isn't given a name, but we do know she's an innocent from Bethlehem. And she will be a sacrifice, literally cut up and sent to the tribes saying we need to come together and rebuild God's promises. Maybe, 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 throw in a few more maybes here. Matthew is thinking something like this. An innocent from Bethlehem will die and rise again. But this will be a call for all everyone to draw together in common cause to preserve God's promises. Therefore, the creation of the church itself. An innocent from Bethlehem dies in Judges 19 in order to set off events that will result in the Gentiles being brought in. So too, an innocent from Bethlehem will die and come back in the Gospel of Matthew, which then will become a call to bring in the Gentile nations as part of God's continuing promises throughout time. And so this is where I'm at, and this is where I'm going to leave it as I turn to my conference paper that I'm going to have to present in January, but I didn't want this just to linger in a forgotten place shared with no one and not develop any further. So I have a YouTube channel put up on YouTube. If it has an audience, it it does. If not, I have notes to myself in verbal form to maybe dust this off someday and look for publication.